All right, welcome into another Office Hours podcast. Today we're joined by Howard Mittman, CEO of Bleacher Report. And Howard, you joined the media industry 1998. A lot has changed since then, for the good or, or the bad. Change is good. Change is inevitable. You have to just sort of roll with it. So I, I, I tend to think the ability we have as media companies that consumers have to you know, reach the world and push information out. How could that be a bad thing? You know, we we lived in a world previously where you, you know, you had to literally own a printing press to get your, your voice heard. Uh, your printing press is in your pocket now. And so I think um, the fact that it's so much harder to silence voices, information, truth, uh, it certainly leads to some weird places. I think we're seeing that, you know, politically and in a number of ways now. But uh, inevitably, I, th- I think it's been great change. Yeah, and been good for obviously the business now that you've been running for the last two yeah. years. What is uh, what has that been like coming off your your former role, coming into a place where theoretically you were taking over for the person who was one of the people who had started the business? Yeah, well, my first day, um, I thought I dressed casual, so I wore like a really casual suit, <laughs> like a short sleeve polo shirt and sneakers with no socks, because like. That tells the that's world. That's what the cool kids Yeah, that's do, right? I'm a fun guy, yeah. you know? <laughs> and um, I might as well have been wearing a tuxedo. So that's the last day I've worn a suit. That's a pleasure awesome. report, yeah. Um, so other than my, you know, haberdashery evolution, I would say, or, or uh, the, you know, slow decline of, of how I'm dressing <laughs> it, uh, relative, relative to Condé Nast standards, um, it's the exact same job, and it's, it's wildly different. And I, I think the... The thing that I didn't anticipate that has been so much fun is that the media industry, magazines in particular, and I think there are other mediums, radio and others, that have, have been through an intense um, moment of disruption, and, and some of them have started to come out of it or found new innovative ways to do so. Um, the linear business, not not just at Turner. I mean, Turner Sports is doing fabulously well and continues to grow, and we all know live sports is an anchor of, you know, um, consistency in, in, in you know, an insane world of, of broadcast right now. But um, the experiences I had there over the last 12 years, over, over the 12 years I was there, um, have given me such an amazing template uh, to use to try to figure out how to help the rest of this business, not just Bleacher Report, but Turner. And so um, that's been a, a lot of fun and not something I actually anticipated. What was it like when... Dave came to you and and was like you know you're gonna be the guy and, and that conversation that you guys had because I'm I'm assuming as someone who started something I don't even know what that would be like being like hey this is your ship now it it wasn't one conversation uh, it was ten months of bouncing around to hotel lobbies and um, clandestine spots uh, literally across the country uh, we were in New Orleans at the same time we were in L A at the same time we were, we were basically having an affair. And, um, work wife, work yeah, husband, yeah, it is. yeah. And, um, you know, at a, at a certain point, um, it, it just became clear that I was sitting in meetings, hearing things, whether it be with customers or, or just brainstorming. And I found myself thinking about how I could apply this out to Bleacher Report. And, um, when it became clear that my heart was there more than it is, um, uh, it was where I was, um, it just became the perfect time. I wasn't looking for it. I, I truthfully thought I'd be a Condé Nast forever. Um, but it, it just felt like the right moment, the right place, and, and the right opportunity. And now you're wearing joggers, uh, bomber jackets, and 5 o'clock shadow. <laughs> I do, yeah. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, as, mu- as much as a you know 45-year-old man can pull that off, I, I do my best, yeah. Nice. And, and now, as you've gotten into the role and pretty much gotten your hands on, on Bleacher Report, what's been the most exciting part of the last you know few years for you? Yeah, you know, the, the business is... is been on an incredible run since 2017, the early part of 2017. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, seeing the growth, seeing the evolution of the business, seeing um, some of the ways that I think we've been able to bring in best practices from outside of BR, while at the same time um, interjecting them into the culture in a way that allows the best parts of what BR does to to grow and, and flourish and, and not be threatened by it. And so if I do my job right, uh, I'm sort of bridging the gap between the two, and I think we've brought in a, a handful of executives who, who've been able to sort of do that and help us with that. And, you know, there are just some things ar- uh, in particular around um, social growth and, and innovation and that BR does better than anyone in the world, full stop. Uh, <clears throat> and so there's just so much to learn there. But I think as good as we are in some of those areas, there have been some other things 
uh, that we've been able to sort of learn from uh, that the rest of the world figured out 50, 60 years ago. So what are the good and the bad or good in the learning processes? Um, I think I think things that we needed to evolve. Um, marketing is, is certainly a discipline we needed to evolve. And so even something as small as our sales materials, you know, and the, the constant uh, churn of them and, and updating them and taking all of the data and the information that we use uh, to help create great content and to help drive our app uh, and, and opening it up so our customers can benefit from it. I think there's a, a number of things like events. You know, there was no event practice at BR. We built an, an entire experience team. We have three successful events that we run per year as 10 polls. We have uh, introduced the um, uh, an event at NBA All-Star. We have uh, the uh, jump off, which is around Summer League in Las Vegas every year. And then we have uh, the drop up, which is a sort of a combination of a streetwear drop and a pop-up shop that we do here in New York City. We're partnering with Chinatown Market and uh, have a bunch of sponsors coming in, have a number of musical acts. And so it's a nice way to sort of celebrate BR kicks and evolve and grow that business into something of, of substance. Do you think at some point there becomes a ceiling for, <clears throat> for what it is, both digitally and, and even, you know, physically? Or or is it you have to continue to find ways to develop new and unique franchises that you can, that you can build underneath? Yeah. I think the most interesting thing about BR is that it is a business that has always been about the pivot. And uh, we, we have forever and always been building one, you know, business and executing on one business plan as we've pivoted towards another. So in the beginning, it was Google, right? It's just arbitraging traffic. <laughs> could, you know, could Dave and his three high school buddies figure out a way to um, grow traffic? And they did. And then they hired an ad sales person, Brian Kelly, who's our SVP of sales um, from CBS. He was 30, all of 30. And they're like, go sell some ads, you know? And, and it out. they did. And, and then over time, they built a team and they figured out how to apply revenue to the scale that they had amassed. <clears throat> and then they pivoted um, out uh, to social and, and they were running, executing the display businesses. They pivoted to social. And during that time, they also were uh, purchased, you know, bought by uh, Turner, Warner Media, Time Warner at the time, and then um, figured out how to interject NBA and NCAA and MLB into the ecosystem and using those live sports rights in ways. And so they, at each step, they've been doing that. The biggest pivot we're on now is, um, you know, we're executing one of the most successful social businesses in the world. Uh, we have a branded content studio playmaker that, you know, does a ton of branded content for our clients uh, to run into our ecosystem campaigns that we're doing with a number of sports leagues and teams and other, you know, big brands, uh, packaged goods and others that are being used not just on our platforms, but across uh, other platforms and other channels. So <clears throat> the pivot is going to be how do we sort of continue to do that as we shift our attention to our app, which is, you know, clearly the, the most important initiative that we have. Um, we call it Sports Plus Plus, where our app project is now, uh, I think you know this, going to be taking um, – BR Live, which is a separate OTT app we have, and injecting that into the current BR app. And then as we continue to push out social features like we have, uh, you know, fire button, commenting, um, <clears throat> direct messaging, and a host of other things, we see that evolving uh, in a way that allows us to capture the benefit of what an OTT does, which is the strategy that most other sports companies are employing, but really not build an OTT, try to build a social media platform unto itself for younger millennial and Gen Z sports fans. And so we are actively building and investing that to a significant degree as we're running the core business now across, you know, social and our owned and operated channels. So what's the percentage of time look like when you <clears throat> kind of break it down between social, owned and operated, the new app, the new initiatives? Yeah, sorry. I'm being told to drink water because my <laughs> voice is getting froggy. I have <laughs> kids. It, it, I have kids. It's that time of year. Yeah. They just, they bring stuff home, man. It's getting a little chilly. You're walking the subway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah how it is. Uh, I'm never cold though, so that, that's okay. Um, what was the question? I totally forgot. <laughs> no, I'm like, good. the percentage of focus when it comes down to the initiatives, right? You have your core business, the owner and operated social, and then you're also talking about the app. Like, what does that look like from a, an internal standpoint as you guys look to try and build out these different versions of what the future of BR looks like? I don't know that I could break it out in terms of time, but I can break it out in terms of time consumer spend. So. Uh, about almost 50% of our traffic and our revenue happens inside of our app right now. That That is an incredibly important focus. Um, then about 40% happens across our social channels. And then the rest is podcasts and other things like that. So uh, for us, um, we, we really believe that what we have in our social network is a feedback loop that can sort of like 
attract and push attention back over towards the app. And if we can get reciprocity between the two so that they're working you know, symbiotically with each other, over time, we think that the app itself can replace a lot of what we're currently now doing across social. So you think it could be a standalone platform just for VR as a whole? Yeah, the way that we think about the media landscape is as a continuum, right? So on, on one end, you have publishers and, you know, any sports publisher or any media publisher that you might have jotted down in your little notebook there probably fits really neatly into that. And on the other end of the, the continuum, you have platform. Where we sit is somewhere in the middle because 50% of our traffic and revenue happens on our owned and operated channel. We have a phenomenal amount of data on our consumers. We own the entirety of the experience, the ad experience. There's no algorithm that will get tweaked in the middle of the night and hurt us on that half of our business. And that puts us in a really advantaged situation relative to the rest of the media landscape. So as we continue to move further and further down with features, functionality, live betting strategies, we think that the opportunity exists for us to move further down the continuum to be more of a platform than a publisher. Got it. <clears throat> and then you talked about features, functionalities, you talked about betting, everyone's talking about betting fantasy. How does that play into overall VR uh, strategy and, and how do you guys feel like you're gonna take a different approach from everyone else who's trying to run to what they believe is the next yeah. area for publishers to make a lot of money? It's a gold rush, you, didn't, you hadn't heard? No, I, I, yeah. not once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I, I think we were one of the earliest uh, to come out with a deal of, of size and scale. The partnership we have with Caesars is working really well. We have, uh, you know, live betting shows. We have pregame shows. We have uh, taken a really important big leap from a content stance. Um, having that studio, which is built on the, you know, the casino floor inside the sportsbook in Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, gives us a huge advantage. Uh, it allows us to be live with experts. It allows us to launch a number of shows that are some of which are coming out, some of which have already come out. Um, but I think ultimately, the different stance that we have than most, we're not going to be a bank. We're not trying to be a bank. Um, completely aware of the lower funnel opportunities and the attribution models and the affiliate opportunities that can come with directing traffic towards those entities that do that are or do want to be banks. That's rather obvious. I'm more interested right now in the evolution of storytelling and how betting evolves the kind of coverage we have for sports fans. So our fundamental goal is simple. We, we want to make it as easy as possible to be a sports fan. And so when we're writing about things, whether it be, you know, the Warriors game last night or the World Series, um, we want to make sure that we're giving fans enough information so that they can build their fantasy team around the content that they get from Bleacher Report. You know, when you come to the app, you have to get all the information you need. So it's not just about culture. It's got to be about sports. It's got to make it as easy as possible for you to be a sports fan. And so right now in this theoretical gold rush, um, the only folks I see getting rich are the ones that sell the shovels. And I think, um, I think that the uh, content and the way that we're pushing out content and the way that we'll continue to engage consumers are the shovels and we'll do it not for the tip of the spear. I don't, we don't exist for the sharps, you know, for whatever small percentage of people have eight betting apps and are, you know, there are other places to go for those people. I, I tend to think a lot of them are probably going to continue to bet offshore yep. because they're not going to want to pay taxes on um, the kind of size and scale that they're already betting, but we'll see how that plays out. And there are other brands that are built to service them for us. It's about information and ease of use and accessibility. Uh, we want to make it as easy as possible to be a sports fan. And so I'm very, very focused on the content lens and on making sure the consumers get what they want, whether they're building a fantasy team or they're looking to place a bet in a state where it's legal. So when it comes to the betting play and the betting strategy, how much does the parent company involvement with Bleacher Report, their live rights, does that dictate anything? Or have you guys had conversations around that in terms of what they're doing from an in-play predictive, even potentially more so? Yeah, there's a number of conversations going on uh, across the company. I, I think, to me, the most interesting element is is 5G. And when you think about connected consumers and connected stadiums and, and how we can create opportunities to give and service them with the information they need live time, regardless of where they are, by removing latency, I think you start to see where the power of 
AT&T and, and the opportunities inherent in 5G start to combine with the media business. And I don't think that's just true for Bleacher Report. I think that's true for, you know, everyone across the Warner Media portfolio in a you know, number of ways that span outside of betting. It must be nice to have a parent company like AT&T to support too, right? They've been great owners so far. I mean, you know, they're, they're, um, they're truly a technology first company. And, and, and when you think about innovation and leadership in those arenas, um, you know, their investment in their track record speaks history. So we, we really um, love the partnership and, and we love the uh, opportunities that seem to be coming to us because of it. Let's talk about your investment in soccer. Obviously, that's been a big push for you guys um, with the rights and with what you guys have done from a BR football standpoint. Was that part of that pivot as you looked and said, okay, what are some of the areas that we feel like we can cover better? And how does that even just evolve outside of probably building more franchises around BR football? Yeah, I think when I spoke earlier about some of the opportunities inherent to having a uh, app like ours with you know 20 million total downloads and nine and a half million consumers opted in to receive alerts, you get a lot of data, right? <laughs> that helps. And so, yeah, it helps just a little bit. Just a little bit. Um, so the data that we're able to collect from that and, and what we looked at and what we learned from it was that, truthfully, all the cool kids are into soccer. And uh, soccer is growing here in the U.S. in a significant way. And, and not just UEFA, but across the spectrum. But what we found, the data that we have, supports the, um, the hypothesis, I suppose you could call it, that if you are a soccer fan in the U.S., there's a very, very good chance, like a 9 in 10 chance, that you start with UEFA. And so it became important to us to forge a relationship with them and develop uh, content rights and opportunities around that so that we could use that as a way to sort of broaden the horizon and give younger millennial and Gen Z fans more of the soccer coverage they wanted in a way that they wanted to get it. And the similarities in terms of the social graph from what you see between soccer and NBA are really stark. I mean, yeah. they're, they're almost identical, the NBA being larger, but uh, we, we see a lot of opportunities and we, we think that what we've been able to do with House of Highlights and Bleacher Report and, and just you know and, uh, BR Hoops and across the entirety of the portfolio gives us a chance to leverage some of those learnings and build a pretty significant audience and point of connection and coverage for uh, consumers around the sport of soccer. And, and to date, that has worked pretty well. When you're building these franchises <clears throat> like Gridiron, House of Highlights, what you're doing with BR Football, how much of it is spent and thought about audience versus like revenue? I'm sure you know some of it in terms of like getting it started, you guys were like, okay, well, let's just invest here and we're going to make money at the end. Is, is that kind of the, the, the playbook? Well, I hope my bosses aren't listening, but um, we exist to serve fans. And and so everything we do comes from that perspective. And we, we think about how we can create an entry point that allows us to open up a new audience, serve fans in a different way, and, and again, make it as easy as possible to be a sports fan. So when we think about it, we think about it there. And then if we do it right, the revenue opportunities will come. BR Kicks is a really great example of that. You know, We did not invent sneaker culture. Nobody who proclaims to invent sneaker culture invented sneaker culture, by the way. But there are a number of brands that have been doing it longer. There are brands that do it, um, you know, in different ways. And what we saw is we felt like there was an opportunity to democratize uh, sneaker coverage. We felt there was an opportunity to really find that direct connection between athletes and fans through the lens of sneakers. And so what we did is we tested that and we built a small team and we went out and now, BR Kicks is the most engaged sneaker brand on all of Instagram. So we think that we were able to do that uh, because we saw an opportunity from a content perspective, from a fan perspective, a user perspective, and then uh, we applied a business sensibility to it after. We did the same thing with House of Highlights. House of Highlights was built and run for almost two years before we ever even allowed ads on the platform. And now, when you look at it, it is a thriving business that is doing incredibly well. And... Um, it all comes from that same sensibility. What's the next House of Highlights, the next <clears throat> BR Kicks for you guys? I don't know that there's a next House of Highlights. I mean, House of Highlights on its own is maybe the most disruptive brand in all of sports. And so what we're focused on is we're focused on trying to figure out how to, um, how to build that, how to play off that. We have a, a thriving and successful business on YouTube. You know, I think... Uh, TikTok is a great example. We launched three months ago on TikTok, and we have 1.6 million followers. Now, there are some brands who say, well, we have more followers. You've been there for years. We've been there for three months. And Bleacher Report, in aggregate, has a really successful history of not always being a first mover. We test. 
we learn, we watch, and then we apply the programming strategy and the distribution strategies we have out to markets, not in a not as a shotgun, but as a rifle. It is a really targeted and focused approach. And so when we move into a market, it's deliberate, it's intentional, and it represents sometimes years of evaluation. Um, so I don't know that there's a next house of highlights per se, but I think what you'll start to see is a number of shows and a, and a content evolution, I'll stop short of calling it a revolution, but a content evolution that gives us more opportunities to um, just open the aperture on the kinds of content that we can create and then how we can push that back into our ecosystem and then how we can push that back to the app. So if you saw the champions uh, this week, which is our soccer focused uh, show, it's an animated series. We push that out and release it for 24 hours inside of the BR app. So the only place to access it was inside the app. Then we pushed it out across our social channels, giving, again, consumers reason to use content, to think about content and experiences as, as a, a benefit and a bonus to downloading the app and being a part of that community. How do you see personalities playing a role in the evolution of your content? Obviously, Bleacher Report does have some personalities, but in terms of percentage-wise compared to other media brands, I wouldn't say it's nearly the same. Is that something that you guys see plays a factor in this, especially <clears throat> as you know, we talk about podcasts and potential evolution where you guys are headed there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think we there are definitely brands that have done more of it and ha have done it better. I, I think when we think about the business, we think about it quite differently than Again, back to that continuum, almost anyone that you'll put into the, you know, the, the far side of that publisher spectrum. Um, distribution is king at Bleacher Report. Content needs to be queen. Like, it needs to be a very close second. It needs to be well represented. But um, the difference between us and everyone else is that we, we think about distribution and we're allowing now the opportunity through some of those shows and those voices to have content and content experiences and personalities bubble up. And so if you look at what we've been able to do with um, Adam Lefko or uh, Taylor or, uh, you know, Master Tisfacian, we, we have a number of talent that that is starting to percolate. And we have a, a number of, of folks like the the Through the Wire guys, uh, who have been, you know, a top 20 podcast uh, that are associated with House of Highlights. We are really, I think, using the, uh, the new focus we have on content to try to give them voice and opportunity. But I'll stop short of saying that we are a, an IP factory, that that's not what we want to do. We're, we're going to be focused on distribution and you know, make it as easy as possible to be a sports fan. That, that's our number one goal. And, and you talked about the rifle and, and where you guys have you've hit, but I think it's always interesting to kind of feel like where you guys have missed to where are some of the areas that you feel like you guys have missed or maybe haven't gotten it right just yet. I think podcast is an area where you could argue we waited a little too long. Uh, I think we were probably underinvested in that. So I've been here about two and a half years. I think that would have been the time to push our chips to the center of the table. Uh, I think it's a confluence of factors, um, not the least of which is I, I hear the reports. I'll stop short of saying I know the revenue. I hear the reports of what revenue is being brought in at other places. And some of it I believe and some of it I have questions on. Um, there's a complete and total lack of metrics. And so um, everything's double counted, nothing's deduped. everyone's just presenting the biggest possible number. Um, there's no way it's real. There's just no way. And so I'll stop short of saying there's a pod apocalypse about to happen because yeah. there's lots of other folks who've you know, forecast that and projected it. But um, I see it growing. I see voices being you know, an incredibly important part of the org and we will and are investing in it pretty heavily. I think we'll have some big announcements soon that will surprise a number of folks and we're excited about, but I don't know that it's all that it's cracked up to be. So I think we missed the boat there. Uh, we're getting a little later, but I don't know that this gravy train is going to continue the way that some would like you to believe it would. And we've talked about revenue. We've talked about mix. How do you guys see your revenue kind of breaking down in, in the future? And what are you guys mostly focused on? I know you guys have dabbled in commerce. I know you guys have gotten into events. Everyone talks about media companies now having to buy diversified to succeed. Not all of them have parent companies like you guys do, so it's a little bit of a difference, but yeah, where else... We're definitely trust fund kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Doesn't, doesn't hurt to have that type of support, but where else now, as you guys evolve BR beyond what it has been and like look into building this platform inside this app, like where does the focus become from a revenue standpoint? Uh, there, I think there's two things I'll, I'll focus on. One is as the app continues to scale uh, and, and we interject live, there will inevitably be... Uh, subscription opportunities for video. There will be, you know, one-off opportunities for video. So that, that's something we're excited about. Um, 
we're also really focused on as the app scales. I think that opens up new revenue models, some of them potentially being lower funnel opportunities, which are you know, not always the place that we play right now. We're a middle to upper funnel brand. So I think that that's exciting and, and probably exciting for our um, a lot of our advertisers. They can connect the top of the funnel at the bottom, theoretically. Um, on the other, you know, other areas we're looking at, there's a lot of licensing and development deals that are in the works now, some of which I've alluded to uh, that I think we can, you know, we'll, we'll look forward to announcing. Not dissimilar some of the stuff that we've done, like the Ron Artest series, A Quiet Storm, that we launched with Showtime. We have a number of content-based opportunities, and that all gives us dual monetization opportunities um, for the content that we're creating now. What about products? Do you guys eventually roll out a product at some point? Is there uh, something else that you guys are selling beyond merch? Like a ketchup, like a BR branded ketchup. Um, Complex makes twenty million dollars selling hot sauce. I think it was ten. They ten, said. ten, ten million dollars yeah. selling hot 20 sauce. Twenty sounds good. Look, if they're making ten million hot sauce, that's it. Kudos to them. Yeah. Like, I think they they did a great job with that show. I think it's a really good example of how you can um, take a, a content based opportunity, build a community around it, and then and then push out something. Who, who five years ago would have thought Complex would be in the you know hot sauce business? So like. You know, I don't, I don't know Rich. I know him from Twitter, but I'm, I'm, I think that that's a great example, and he, he deserves a lot of credit for that. That's a really great entrepreneurial opportunity. Yeah. Um, I don't see that in our future necessarily, although, you know, we have a cooking show with Serge Ibaka, so, you know, had Kevin Durant in the first episode. You, yeah. you, you know, you Serge never... Ibaka apron? Serge Ibaka Yeah, who knows? Please. I don't know. I don't, you know, anything's possible, right? The George Foreman had a grill, so, we, you know, we'll see where it goes. But... I think for us, uh, you know, we, we have a, a thriving e-com business right now. So we, we found that um, our business is not necessarily going to be built from an e-com standpoint on um, something happens in the world of sports and we push out a T-shirt and, you know, steal IP and, and get it out there. That, that's not who we are as a brand. Again, having deep-pocketed parents. Um, helps. Helps, but it, it, also, it also means you're not going to do those kinds of things, yeah. right? So... Um, what we are focused on is that we did a partnership with Dwayne Wade. And that partnership with Dwayne Wade was, you know, an amazing opportunity that then allowed us the chance to uh, sit at that perfect nexus of content and commerce. You know, we built a content experience around his last dance and his last season. We're one of the small handful of brands that got a chance to work with him. And then we sold those shirts out across Bleach Report and House of Highlights. They performed exceptionally well. Um, you know, everyone really celebrated that uh, in his camp, at his agency, at CAA, uh, at Bleacher Report, and that was a, a fantastic model. We've since done that with Mariano Rivera and Billie Eilish and the U.S. Women Nationals team and a, a whole host of other um, premium level executions. We did one with Travis Scott last year that sold out in uh, like 30 minutes, 33 minutes, something like that. So. Um, these, if you, if you think about it in terms of streetwear drops and, and those moments, those high-end moments, that's probably what we're focused on. We do sell, of course, House of Highlights gear. We sell BR gear. But we see the bigger opportunity as that nexus between content and commerce, and we're really uh, chiefly focused on it. Now, back to Dwayne Wade for a second. Like, that started a path and a relationship that then built up a level of trust that then allowed us the chance to, just a couple of weeks ago, I think two weeks ago now at opening night, announce that, D. Wade is the new creative director for Bleacher Report. He's also going to be sitting, you know, on Turner, on, on inside the NBA, and, and you know, uh, that's a, a great opportunity to, to show how e-commerce opens up doors and creates connections and then has allowed us to form deeper relationships with some of the biggest talent in the world. So what's that role going to look like? Because a lot of times people get titles and it's just like, you know, it's yeah. an honorary degree. You know, what's Dwayne's actual impact going to be with you guys? We're going to co-share an office. He's coming in 9 to 5 every <laughs> Monday to Friday. Um, Not a bad person to hang out with. Yeah, it's great. You know, we're boys. We're yeah. super tight that yeah. way. Um, finishing each other's sentences. No, look, we're, we're in the process of, of figuring that out now. Um, the, the good news is, is, is he's engaged. The, the, this will not be something where it's like a title and, you know, a press release and it goes away. We're, he's going to, you know, EP a number of projects with us. We're already starting to work on things. I think you'll probably see things coming out more around this sensibility that we have that the stadium tunnel is the new men's runway and the convergence of music and culture and fashion around sports is, is something that continues to grow by leaps and bounds almost every day. I think you'll probably see a couple of executions, at least a couple of the executions, fall neatly into that area because it's an, an intense interest for him personally. It's also something he's got a lot of experience with. Um, and then we'll start to look at other things from there. But we're very much in the development process now, and he is uh, 
engaged and interested and has shared some ideas and some thoughts and we're, we're really are truly going back and forth interesting and he's not sharing an office no not sharing right an office dang it i wouldn't mind sharing an office with Dwayne wade probably make you he could share the basketball court with you at least he's i don't think he could keep up with me but yeah uh, okay it's a, it's a half court it's an eight foot rim right is what, is what i was no it's a, it's a 10 foot no, rim but kidding. somebody dunked on it and it's a little bent right now we no, gotta fix that that's that's, you know, we'll get someone on that. You yeah. guys will get someone on it. Um, as you look at the Too other... many good high school and, like, you know, D3 athletes in one building together. Yeah. Somebody's bound to... Someone's bound to break yeah. it. And you talk about youth sports. I know BR and, and a lot of these different organizations have looked at youth basketball and youth sports as a yeah. whole. What's youth sports playing in your guys' future? Is there is there a big push around that? Yeah, there is. I mean, I think, you know, BR Hoops is a good example of it. House of Highlights is an example. We've launched some pro camps with House of Highlights, um, bringing professional athletes in and allowing kids to celebrate in that moment to learn with them and learn to love the game. Um, we've not pushed out uh, in any intense way outside of BR Hoops for high school sports. I mean, I think there's a there's an opportunity there for distribution. I don't honestly believe there's a massive opportunity for monetization. So I also worry a lot about the, you know, amateur status of some of these athletes. We have some um, deals that we're putting out that are at a larger scale, that documentaries and things that you'll see announced soon that we're excited about. But when you're talking about selling 50 or 100 branded content videos against high school kids, the mistakes will be made. And so we, we haven't seen it yet, but... Um, I mean, look, I, there's even a point where LeVar Ball, you like it or not, he was like, I'm going to charge people to, f to film LaMelo and... It, it starts to get interesting. You know, I don't think we've seen anyone lose their amateur status as of yet, but it's coming and it will change that small sector of the industry pretty significantly. So I think um, right now it, there's, you know, some small amounts of money flying around, not a lot, um, but it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. How does this college athletic ruling and potentially opportunity for them to monetize their name, image, and likeness, obviously not anytime soon within the probably the next two to three years, and we don't even know what's going to happen there. Yeah. What does that look like for, for Bleacher Report, and if anything at all? I, I don't know, I mean, is, is the real answer. We're, we're obviously partners with the NCAA on March Madness uh, and CBS, and so we work really closely with them. We talk to them all the time. We have direct access to the you know, people who are making the decisions. And I think we're taking a wait and see. I, I, on a personal level, I think it's a great thing. Uh, I think it's about time. Um, I do think that there are ways that you can use the logos and the licenses on a national level. I see a lot more immediate opportunities for local. So you own a local Ford dealership in Columbus, Ohio. It's going to be a lot of people driving around <laughs> new Ford trucks. But you're going to want Justin Fields to come and sign, you know, memorabilia on, on your, you know, fall Saturday truck push, right? That, that's just easy. And so it's good you, business. You, it's great. And it, it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's, um, it's something I think that is deserved for the athletes, for the fans of the programs. I think it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, how you control that is what the NCAA is tasked with figuring out and how you make sure it doesn't spiral out of control. Um, but yeah, I, I think I believe in meritocracy in all forms and I think it's a great one. And so if those athletes have a chance to earn some money, so be it. I, you know, I went to the Ohio State Wisconsin game with my kids. We bought Five hundred dollars worth of gear, you know. The university is going to get paid on that. The kids should get some because a lot of it bears their image, their likeness, their number. We've talked a lot about the way where <clears throat> you guys are going, where you've come from. What are you guys looking at as potential obstacles along the way, or areas where you're like someone could usurp us somewhere? It's it's uh, it's obviously hard in, in your position to probably even think about that given the backing and and there's the support you have as an overall organization. But what disruptors do you see disrupting? Theoretically, what were the disruptors? Um, I, th I think we're all we're all competing with with the reality. There's only 24 hours in a day, right? And so, you know, right now we have an app that consumers open on average four and a half times a day. That's fantastic. I mean, that, that's platform like numbers. Is that going to be 70? Should it be? I mean, for the good of society, probably not, yeah. right? So. Um, we need to sleep. We need to disconnect. I think what we're what I'm looking at more is is you know obviously through House of Highlights and Bleach Report a highlight driven culture and what that means. And I think um, pay a lot of attention to what that means for younger sports fans. And and that's where the coverage that we provide off the court is as important as the coverage that we provide on the court or on the field of play. Uh, how you bridge that gap and how you maintain your 
level of competitive, so competitiveness, so that as I said earlier, you can build your fantasy team from the information you get off Bleacher Report, but you can also find out like, you know, what you know, new news or information is happening or what new sneaker unboxing is happening or, you know, what is going on with the lives and in inside of the soap opera that is, you know, today's professional athletes. So um, I think it'll be interesting to see how that evolves and the time spent, if it, as we suspect it will, continues to increase in that kind of coverage, what that means in terms of the amount of time the consumers are willing to spend on games, on live games. Uh, we haven't seen any significant impact now, but <clears throat> it goes back to the strategy that we have with our app. Every other competitor in the world is building an OTT. They're basically building a television replacement on your phone, right? It's fine. It's smart. It's a good play. What they're all focused on is at best two to two and a half hours of consumer attention per day. We are already entertaining consumers for 22 hours a day, theoretically, yeah. right? When we That's not my, counting work or anything right, else that yeah, people yeah. have to do. To, the opportunity to yeah. engage them, you know, 24 hours a day, right? But um, once we add live sports, that's the fundamental difference. Is it's not just an OTT, it's a, it's a platform. And so what we would have called in linear shoulder programming, we're all shoulder programming all the time with a volume and a variety of content that exists not just inside of that which we can create, but pulled in from all of the platforms and all the content creators. That's a really different strategy than anyone else is employing. And when you add live into that, um, we think it's a market-making strategy. Do you see more of some <clears throat> events like the match as part of the, the live strategy as well? These like almost pop-up events of, of sorts? Absolutely. Yeah. I think we golf is not the first sport you think of when you think of Bleacher Report. No. And um, we proved unequivocally beyond a shadow of a doubt that we could drive interest in and around golf and a singular golf event. Now, we have two of the biggest, best-named golfers in the world. That helps. But, yeah, totally. It's like soccer event with Pele. Yeah. So, um, but it proved that a lot of things, um, it improved the importance of a working payment system, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a good <laughs> but, learning lesson, right? Yeah, but yeah, totally. It was a, it was, but it was a phenomenal success for us from a social standpoint, from a PR standpoint, from a revenue standpoint, advertiser revenue, and from a consumer engagement and interest standpoint. We clearly had our well-documented challenges that day, made a decision to sort of be fan first and pull the, you know, paywall down so that, you know, it wasn't compromised for anyone. Um, but yeah, we, we like that model. I think you can expect to see more of it. Across what sports would you like to see the most? Oh, I'm really interested in what could happen when you're cross-pollinating against sports. So, you know, fastest man in the NFL, who's the fastest man in sports? Like, what is it? I'm making this up as I'm going along. Yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. giving you any, yeah, anything yeah. that you can actually use. But, like, what does a tug of war look like between the five strongest guys in the NBA and five NFL running backs? You know, like, I think they're – it's almost like um, – there's this. There's these interesting ways I think that you can do things that have been done in linear before. I think it was like the superstars when we were kids. You know, you had those kind of events and yeah. things in Hawaii. America's American Ninja Warrior. Yeah, yeah. yeah. MXC the way back if you watch like Spike TV. Yeah, I think I think that there's some of that, and I think um, that gives us an interesting opportunity to play around with the boundaries and and the cultural side of sports and merge them in in different ways. So we're we're in our we've been pitched thousands of these opportunities at this point, as you can imagine. Uh, we've come up with a couple on our own, and I think you can probably expect to see some more of that happen. And you talked about the culture and lifestyle side. How does that spin out of BR the sports side or play into BR the sports side? And, and where does the culture and lifestyle, you know, division revenue part of the business go beyond the drop-ups? Is it a music festival? Is it something else beyond this? Because you have the distribution to prove and that you can sell things. Yeah. So. Do you get into these other areas where you're like, we're going to have a BR fits um, fashion event or a BR kicks, you know, shoe exclusive? We look, we like I said, we have the drop up now, which is coming up. We have some musical acts there and we have a bunch of, you know, sneaker unveils and releases and things that will happen. We have a number of shows and series that are launching out of it and covering into it and out of it. Um, I think what we'll continue to do is we'll try to think about our app. And how do we grow monthly active users and how can we create physical or, or, you know, virtual experiences to help drive consumers back to that and to engage them? You know, sports is a bit of a cheat code, right? There's a high level of engagement. There's a high level of passion. Um, there's a high level of recidivism. So, you're, you know, we, we think that um, 
if we can sort of capture that, regardless of how it plays out physically or virtually, and push you back to the app as a main you know, center of experience, we got you. Basically, if we can get a consumer to sign up to alerts, they're ours almost indefinitely. Uh, and, and that's the goal. From a larger media standpoint, what are some of the things, just overall trends that you're you're buying and then you're selling? I know you mentioned you're not too too, <clears throat> you know, bullish on podcasts, but uh, well, I'm bullish on podcasts. I'm not bullish on the outsized revenue expectations that some have for it, or or the, you know, the numbers that, behind it. Yeah, the, the ability to sustain some of those numbers if in fact they're real. Yeah. So what else? Buying, selling. What are you guys looking highly upon? What do you What do you personally think that this is? You know, maybe just a, another buzzword. I don't know. I, I'm, my hater game is pretty strong, so you could probably <laughs> mention something, and I'll tell you I hate it. But I can't think of anything that it, you know, off the top of my head that's re- that's really cheesing me off at this point. And just from a personal standpoint, what's this last two years been like uh, for you? Obviously, you said it's very similar of a job, but I'm sure it's come with challenges. Running a new organization, stepping into a place where you're usurping the guy who would started it, essentially. How has it been both personally, professionally, challenges, wins, victories? What, yeah. what has that whole last couple of years been like? I had the perfect indoctrination period, you know. Um, think of Dave Finocchio, who's the founder and CEO, former CEO, um, has become a really good friend. We, we still text regularly. We talk all the time. Um, I'm, I'm really honored that he brought me in to, you know, this business. I'm, I'm even more honored that he was, you know, part of the recommendation to have me take over this business. And so, um, the opportunity I had to come in and work alongside him and learn, learn with him and, you know, help reshape the sales and marketing team with him and then start the process of working on rebuilding the, you know, content team with him, um, is, is deeply meaningful and, and, and probably factors into a lot of the success that we've had and, and also factors into a lot of the personal satisfaction I've gotten out of this and the pride that I feel and in, in just being able to sort of sit in his seat and and take this brand to, you know, new heights and, and new levels, um, not without him, but but in large way because of him. And I think that's a really special thing. It's not often in the media world where you get, you know, such an amicable, warm, you know, dare I say loving <laughs> relationship yeah. that that is deeply meaningful, I think, on both sides, and that, and that plays out that way. And that works really well for us, who we are. It worked well for the business, the employees therein. There was no moment of friction. Everybody saw this coming. Everybody knew this was coming. This was planned. It was deliberate. It was well thought out. So you have to give a lot of credit to, uh, you know, Lenny Daniels and David Levy before him and, you know, the executives at Turner who allowed for this smooth transition to happen that takes a lot of foresight and um, you don't see that a lot. So the last two and a half years for me have been amongst the best of my entire career. I'm, I'm as happy as I could be, you know, like it's not that many times you have in your life to have a job where, you know, I found out I was getting the job. I went and I told my kids it happened to be on visiting day um, at their summer camp. Perfect timing. I told my, yeah, right. I told my older son, he said, no way, no way, no way. And he turned around and he ran to the bunk screaming, my dad's working at Bleacher Report. My dad's working at Bleacher Report. And the, the punk was going crazy. And then I was like, oh shit. Like, <laughs> What this, did I just do? Well, this is New York. Half, half these dads are in media. Like yeah, I, gotta, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I gotta run in and embargo this shit. Yeah. So, um, but the connection it's allowed me to have with my kids, the connection it's allowed me to have with sports, which is something that I'm so deeply passionate about. And to even have the chance to bridge the gap of my old world with fashion and culture and style and bring that in in ways that are, you know, now obvious, but maybe a few years ago weren't as obvious. Um, It's been a dream. 